Good morning. That's a little better. Hey, we are in a series, as we just talked about, just called What If, and what if we could win with money, and what if our financial picture looked different, and what if we could manage money the way God wanted, and what if that looked different than what culture would tell us, like what if our lives could be different in this area, and one of the things that we want to be as a church is we want to be the greatest disciple-making church in our generation. Like we want to help people look more like Jesus than any other church, and one of the ways that we want to do that is not just in other areas, but in the area of our finances is really important because all of us have this have money to spend. We all have this impact our lives. And so we want to just paint a picture for people. And we believe, as Joey just talked about, we have over 500 people right now connected in going through Financial Peace University. And so we believe it's going to be, yeah, come on. It's going to be incredible. We believe that God's going to change some marriages. We believe that God's going to sow some seeds in some parents that's going to change future generations. We believe that people are going to make foundational uh, decisions about their financial future as they get married. We just believe it's going to change and radically change people's lives, no matter where you are on the spectrum. You know, last week we talked about a couple of statistics. One was 78% of people are paycheck to paycheck. You know, and maybe you find yourself in that camp today. Maybe you're just like always waiting for that next paycheck, whether it's once a month or every other week, you're just are on commission. You're just kind of waiting to make your life work. And then there's people all the way on the other end, right, that, man, that seem to have their financial life together, but maybe you're not paying as close attention as you should, and we really believe God's going to do something incredible to set some people free over the next nine weeks as we started our journey today. And uh, man, one of the stories that we looked at last week to kind of launch into this was when Jesus just tells a little bit of a story about money. And he says this, he says, life's, one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. So in other words, the stuff that you own, your cars, our houses, our clothes, um, man, our, our, all of our, our stuff, it doesn't, it, it doesn't consist in that. It's not what makes us valuable. And he told him a parable and he said this, said, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. So here's what he said. I've got enough money. Anybody in here said that this week? Right? Raise your hand. Say, I got, I've got too much money. Anybody said that? A couple of you? Yeah, right. You're all under the age of six. But that's, <laughs> that's understandable. And he says this. He said, I, I'll do this. I'm going to tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I'm going to store all of my grains and all of my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. And so as we see in this story, what happens is we have two options. Man, we can work in order to, to consume more in life, we either consume more or we create margin. We do one of two things. We can consume more, we can lean into more, and generally what happens is if, you, if we get a raise or a promotion or we make that next sale or we get a windfall, what do we do? Man, we upgrade. How many of you got the new iPhone XR? You already ordered it right now. You ordered it this week, the new iPhone. See, a couple of you already ordered it because we, we know how to upgrade. We know how to consume more. It's built into our culture. Or what we can do is we can create margin. And what that means is I provide some room to be able to move and to live the life that God has for me. You know, when I create margin in my life, it means that everything I have is not consumed by my stuff, by building barns and the abundance of my possessions. But I've created margin, I've created space so I can step into whatever it is, the future that God has for me. So it doesn't matter if you're heavy in debt, right, there's a way you can create margin today. Or it doesn't matter if you have no debt, just looking into your future, but you still need some margin to be able to step into that. And we thought, what better way to, to paint the picture of what margin looks like than to have someone who's actually done that tell their story. And so there's a friend of mine who's been in our church for several years, Mike Ryan. So Mike has uh, created margin in his life. Man, he's created margin to be able to step into what God has for you. And Mike's just like me and you, right? Mike Moved to Milton, man, had all the same dreams that we have, acquire and accomplish, kind of move up the ladder, kind of do the things that are going to make me satisfied, make me feel valuable, validate me. And then Mike just had this moment in his life where he realized, hey, that's not not everything, right? And he began to realize that there was a different way to live. So I'm going to invite Mike on the stage. Let's give Mike a warm Stone Creek welcome. Man, thanks for being here. Let's grab a seat. 
Man, and so we're just going to kind of let Mike walk us through his story and uh, hear from him. And again, like I said, Mike's a guy just like, just like you guys, just like me, just uh, kind of figuring things out and uh, has an incredible family, an incredible story. And so, uh, Mike, just tell us, first of all, tell us a little bit about your family because they're important. Yeah, I got three kids, a uh, 21-year-old junior up at University of Georgia. I know Any that's close to your heart, right? Come on in, Go dog dogs. Um, yeah, Not, I got 20. Whoa, hold on a minute. What? <laughs> no dog fans in here? What's up with that? <laughs> Y'all won yesterday. Come on. Um, 23-year-old son who's uh, in his first big boy awesome. job, Michael. Oh, and uh, Eric, our oldest, 29, is married to Dara. And they've got our two grandsons, Jake oh, and John. Awesome. How, how are, how's, grand, how's grandparents? Man, man, it's better than they tell you it is. Right. I mean, everybody says it's better than parenting. Yeah. It's better than parenting. Come on. That's <laughs> what I'm talking about. That's incredible. Oh, they're gorgeous. At the beach. Oh, yeah, come on. Do that again. Yeah, do it all. That's awesome. That's a great picture. And, of course, that's your wife, Christina. Yep. And how long have you guys been married, roughly? Uh, 30 years, yeah. You're close to the 30-year mark, aren't you? That's it. That's great. Now, tell me, how did you guys meet? Because we'd all love to hear that story. Mm, Can I? I'm not sure I can tell it here. I was picked up in a bar, actually. Yeah. Hey. Same thing happened. To Let, me, let's bro. be real. <laughs> hey, this is Stone Creek. This, that's how this rolls. You said so. be real. <laughs> that's right. That's good. Well, that's exciting. Well, man, a t- little bit about your background, kind of how you grew up, and, and that yeah. kind of thing. I grew up in Detroit, so little suburb of Detroit, down in the hood, and uh, on, grew up man. in a Catholic family. So, uh, kind of rigorous. Catholic yeah. upbringing. We went to mass every Sunday. Parents kind of drug us there, and uh, that was yeah. part of my upbringing. And that instilled in me something, and that began to grow. And so, kind of went through high school years, and God was stirring something in my heart. Didn't didn't really think much about it, uh, but as I got to be a senior and looking to college and trying to figure all those pieces out, just started asking people. Feel like God's stirring something. What does that look like? Um, and everybody said, "Well, you're Catholic. You must have a call to Catholic priesthood." Come on. Um, yeah. Yeah, so actually went into Catholic seminary for three years. Wow. How was uh, that? Uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was good. Uh, yeah. it was, I mean, it was a good discernment process of yeah. discerning that I didn't have a call to Catholic priesthood. <laughs> <laughs> right. Hence married with three kids. Yeah. That's really good. And then from there, you just kind of moved into business and... Yeah, exactly. Kind of transitioned yeah. into the business world. And so what did that look like? Because you owned your own business at one point. And... Yeah, well, I mean, I... Um, I, I, part of my conversion story, I yeah. guess, is is a little bit of that. So yeah. um, I, uh, in that rigorous Catholic upbringing and all of that foundation and three years of Catholic seminary, no, no, never did anyone introduce me that I remember, at least, to a personal relationship with Jesus. So I had religion, I had knowledge about Jesus, but I didn't have a relationship with Jesus. And so um, I met Christina, married Christina, started having kids together, um, and she looked at me and said, hey, we need to get into a church for the kids. Um, um, and yeah. so nearest church to us at the time was Mount Pisgah over in Alpharetta. Yeah. Went there in third or fourth Sunday, clearly heard the gospel for what I remember as the first time, got on my knees, gave my life to Jesus, and wow. that began a different path in life. Yeah, well, that's an incredible story. Because yeah. I know sometimes people miss it. It doesn't matter if they're Catholic or Baptist or Methodist yeah. background. Sometimes there's just this awakening, okay, yes, I'm following Jesus. I'm not just going through the motions, yep. right? And that's when, that's when transformation starts happening. And obviously happened in your life right about that time for yeah, sure. Yeah, exactly. So I was going through all of that. Um, and uh, as I was beginning to live out my faith, um, which I just really embraced at that time, uh, I was in a business partnership that frankly, he wasn't a believer. And, uh, and so we were not aligned in how we were living life and how we were living in that business. And I just went to him and probably had the conversation you've had with a girlfriend or two and, uh, and, and said, uh, it's me, not you. Um, (laughs) and, and we need to break up. Uh, so left that business behind, started a new business called floor works, flooring business. And God just anointed that business. I mean, it, it grew quickly. It was really profitable. We were giving away a bunch of what we were making, but more importantly, it was just kind of a place where we could live out our faith. Um, um, Christina and I as, as a couple and the business, and it was a place where Christ's name was made known. And so there were, you know, three or four Bible studies that different people led in the business environment. I got to lead people to Christ in my office. I mean, there were vendors and employees and customers that would come in and say, wow, this, this place is different. I mean, something is different about this place. What is it? And when they asked what it is, that was the chance to kind of share Jesus with them. Yeah. So it was, it was a cool environment. I mean, we were rocking along, giving, yeah. serving, doing everything, checking all the boxes. So at this point, yeah, you're kind of, 
you've got the, you own your own business, so that's going pretty well. You have possibly your dream home, um, yeah. you know, and then, so you, in, in your mind, you've kind of, you're there, you've arrived. Yeah, we were there. I mean, I, I think we were kind of patting ourselves on the back. Everybody looked into the Reinsel family and said, wow, they're, they're doing good. Yeah. Um, they're doing good financially. They're good, doing good missionally. Yeah. Um, and we were checking the boxes, but then God started to stir a little bit. Yeah. So tell me a little bit just about that process, man. When you say God was stirring something up in your heart, a lot of times I know people don't have a, they think that's that God only speaks to Moses and some special group of people, but we yeah. know that, I mean, that should be normal, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't have those burning bush Moses experiences, yeah. but I have found that when I'm in the Word and when I get quiet, I hear the voice of God. I don't, he doesn't shout at me, he doesn't do the burning bush thing, uh, but he'll whisper. And so yeah. if I get in a place where I can hear the whisper, yeah. I hear the voice of God. So an important part of my life every day is just waking up, getting into the Word and getting into a quiet place, away yeah. from life, away from the thoughts of everything about the day and yeah. just listening and that's where I began to hear the whisper so you just had this kind of I always it's like a tugging or an impulse or sometimes it's like hey I just want to do that you just kind of have this sense of knowing yeah it wasn't like yeah. a real tangible whoa yeah. God spoke into my yeah. ear it was just more feeling that God was speaking right yeah. and so where did that live? what was the path for that yeah well always be careful when God starts whispering <laughs> um yeah the the funny thing is I um I fought that for a while, so I probably spent six months battling back and forth with God. Hey, we're faithful. We're living out our faith in this business environment. We're trying to serve in the community. We're serving in the church, checking all yeah. the boxes. Yeah. Um, but he kept stirring. And so eventually, after about six months, I went home to Christina, um, and I wasn't looking forward to this conversation, to be honest. <laughs> um, but I went to her, and we had just built Christina's dream house. She and my daughter show horses. So had the riding ring and the stable and nice house and all of that. Five yeah. acres over in Alpharetta. I mean, we'd arrived. And yeah. uh, so I went home to Christina and I said, honey, I think God wants us to sell the house and be debt free, mortgage free. And I don't know what he's got for us, but I think it's something different than what we're doing today. And she looked at me and she said, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and, and I said, uh, my, my wife's a little salty, kind of spirited personality. Yeah. You, you know her a little yeah. bit. Oh, yeah. um, she, can, she can bring some of that. And so I said, well, honey, <laughs> would you at least pray about it? And she looked at me. She said, no, I don't think I will. <laughs> um, I know what happens when you pray. Um, uh, <laughs> and so I, I just let it go for a couple of weeks. And about two weeks later, she came back and she said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to pray, but I'm going to pray specifically if this is God and not you, because I think it might be you and not God, um, yeah. that he'll give us a contract quickly and for the dollar amount we need to get out of the house. And I thought, well, okay, that's a start. Called up the real estate agent, listed the house. Literally just over a week later, the agent calls me yeah. and he says, Mike, there's a guy that looked at your house, wants to meet you over there and ask some questions about the house. And so I pull into the driveway. I was at work, pulled into our driveway. And as I'm pulling down the driveway, I looked and it was like, I know that guy. So I get out of the car, I introduce myself. I said, I feel like I know you. I can't place where I know you from. He said, well, actually, you coached my son Hayes in basketball at Mount Pisgah. I was gotcha. like, oh, yeah. I remember Hayes. We made small talk, walked through the house, talked about the house. Yeah. And at the end of the conversation, he looks at me in the eye and he says, can I ask you a personal question? I said, sure. He says, if this is your wife's dream house, it's close to work, school, church, all of that, why are you selling I said, hey, great question, and I don't know where you are in your faith life, but here's what God's spinning up in me and in our family, and just for about five minutes, just poured it out there. And he looked at me, he said, okay, thanks. And I thought, well, that kind of sailed over the top. Disconnect. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. But the next morning, seven o'clock in the morning, the guy calls me, he says, we got to have lunch today. So changed my lunch schedule, sitting across the table at lunch, and he looks me in the eye, and he says, Mike... My wife and I were praying last night, and we feel like your house is the right house for our family, but we also think that he connected us to you to a value for whatever he might have for you in ministry and mission, wow. and we'd like to give you a full price offer on your house. Wow. So less than two weeks later, full price offer, that was kind of the fleece that Christina yeah. had thrown out. I mean, Christina... Close to the audible voice, Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. I mean, Christina calls herself a two-by-four girl. I hear the whispers some. Yeah. She doesn't hear the whispers. She needs the two-by-four across the head. And <laughs> yeah. that was her two-by-four, and she, yeah. you know, she was faithful to it. Yeah. How was that telling her? Um, 
about this about the off oh yeah that. oh so yeah, yeah. Um, I mean I couldn't get in the car quickly enough to call her yeah um, <laughs> I mean a little bit to be honest a yeah. little bit of it was see told you so um, oh yeah <laughs> if I'm, I'm I'm being real um, <laughs> but a part of it was just celebrating I mean I had tears running down my yeah. cheek I was like honey you are not going to believe the yeah. lunch I just had I mean it was it was confirming that God had spoken. Because, I mean, you hear the voice of God and you say, okay, is this the voice of God? Is it not? Um, right. But that was clear to her and clear to me that he had a different, different yeah. path for us as a family. Yeah, that's like, here's your sign. So that's, yeah. that's, uh, that's an interesting story. Tell me a little bit now. So now you find yourself with a full price offer. Have you started looking for homes to move into? <laughs> yeah, funny point? part of that. So um, we're talking about the house with the guy that's buying our house. And he said, well, where are you going? Where are you moving to? I said, I, I don't have any clue. I haven't thought about that yet, to be honest. He said, would you consider our house? And I said, well, where's your house? He said, right across there in the subdivision across the street. Ended up, we swapped houses. <laughs> we took his house Lord? as a part of the deal. We then were debt-free. He took our house, and he was not debt-free, but that's his issue. <laughs> I'm not responsible for him. I'm that's responsible right. for me. That's right. Uh, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and so you guys moved in, that, and, which obviously, I think, man, just seen how God worked through all that. And so now, here you are. You're debt-free, and what happens next? Like, you had this clear idea, this is what I need to go do? Like, what happens? Yeah, I mean... To, to be fair, um, I didn't handle it as well as I could have oh, handled yeah. it. So I, I went to a lot of different friends and I said, hey, what do you do now? What does it look like to go into ministry and mission, feel like God's stirring? Um, and talk to a lot of different people, um, but I didn't get into the prayer closet. I didn't go to the throne room of God and say, what do you want me doing? And so I went to an executive pastor role at Mount Pisgah and my business experience and skill sets um, you know, they, they served the mission well, and I had kingdom impact, um, but it wasn't calling for me. And I think there's a big difference between being obedient to God and following calling. Um, yeah. And um, that was not calling versus what I'm doing today. So if you could do that differently, you'd look back and be like, I would take a little more time to actually ask God what he thinks about this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I, th I think his opinion's important. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he showed, he's shown himself faithful. So you... So you in, so now you've so you had a, you have your flooring business. So I'm assuming you quit that job and moved into XP. What happened to your what happens to this successful flooring business is having all this kingdom impact, right? <laughs> yeah. So I ha hired someone to run the business for me. Great guy. He's running the business. I'm in ministry. We're still making the income. Everything's great. We're still kind of serving faithfully, all of that. Um, but then that voice again yeah. um, started to speak, and I was pretty clear that God wanted me to sell the flooring business. Gotcha. And so it was did you make a, a lot of money off of the flooring well, business? Yeah, well, I, I had an opportunity to make a lot of money off gotcha. the flooring business. So had a great offer, perfect people, perfect timing, all of that. And I rationalized um, just the human side of me, rationalized and said, hey, I can hang on to this business, make that much in three years, and we can right. give more away. Um, I mean, I, I used all the God tools to rationalize that. <laughs> Yeah. And the truth is, I was greedy. Um, I was wanting to hold on to what I was clear God wanted me to release. So you knew that you should sell it, but you didn't. I, I knew. In fact, I went to a meeting. Um, the senior pastor at the time went to a meeting with him. We, I was early. He was early for the meeting. We're sitting there talking. He says, hey, what's God stirring up in you? And I said, honestly, I'm a little bit troubled. He said, why? I said, well, I think God wants us um, to sell the business. And I see a tear run down his cheek. I said, what is that about? He said... God spoke to me last week and told me to tell you that God wants you to sell the business. Oh, wow. um, and so that was just confirmation sure. from someone that I believed in, I had a similar heart with and for. So Yeah. So you sold it? Uh, I did not sell it. Gotcha. <laughs> no, I sold it many years later after the economic downturn and the crash in the housing market and sold it for about 10% of what I had an opportunity to gotcha. sell it for at that time. Right. But the cool thing is in all of that, God has me where he wants me today. And yeah. I, I went a different path. Um, you know, you can look at lots yeah. of different biblical characters and they chose a path different. Yeah. Um, God's going to fulfill his plan with or without us. Yeah. And the cool thing is he decided, yeah, I'm still going to restore you and, and do yeah. this through you and with you. Yeah. Um, so even though we're 90% less net worth than we would have been, um, that's great with us. Yeah. Because 
so you, when you sell, when you sell your home and you're debt free and you have all this, you're like, what is that like, man? What does that feel like? Yeah. It's, I mean, it's liberating one. Yeah. Um, it gives you, you talked about margin earlier. Yeah. It gives you margin to do or to be or to express whatever God has for you. Um, yeah. and it just is fulfilling. It's purpose filled. Um, it's really good. Yeah. Yeah. And then so it so you so at this point you 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 sold the home and so now you're free of that and eventually the business you you, you kind of divest yourself of that and you still had didn't you have another property? Yeah, I had a property up at uh, Reynolds Plantation up at Lake Oconee. We had bought many years earlier, nice property, golf course, country club membership, all of that stuff. Yeah. I played golf one time. We didn't even go up there. I mean, it, it wow. became um, this anchor in the Reinsel family life that just was gro- increasingly unhealthy. And we started to realize that all of these things, the acquiring and accomplishing, I mean, I, I was driven to that. I was, I was raised in pretty modest means. And so I was, I was driving, acquiring and accomplishing. And people were patting me on the back. The world surrounded me and said, hey, that's great. Well done. Well done. And I just played off of that. And, um, and then all of a sudden I woke up one day and realized I don't own my possessions. My possessions are owning me. Mm. And that wasn't a very good feeling. Yeah, and so when you went back up there, what was it like before you? Were yeah, so I told <laughs> I told Christina we got to sell this property. She's like, "Yeah, I agree, but why do you say that?" I said, "Because every time I cross the threshold of going into Reynolds Plantation, this switch turns on inside of me yeah. that wants more, um, yeah. that wants to have a country club, that wants to have the nice meals, that wants to have the golf membership, and all of that. And the only way for me not to have that is to div- divest myself of that property." Yeah. I, might not be for everybody, but for me, I knew that. Yeah. Um, and so when you, after you make this decision, you're, man, you're in the process of getting super free. And then there, there, there's a little training that you kind of, you guys got into at that point that probably helped you make some decisions once you, once you jumped in. So yeah. we'll tell a little bit about that. Yeah, we're, we're a little bit older. So financial peace, Dave Ramsey <laughs> didn't exist at the time. Yeah. Um, so Crown Financial Ministries, same biblical principles. Yeah. Um, and we went through that, actually ended up going through it twice because we're slow learners. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then eventually led a, a class, a crown class. But yeah. I mean, that was foundational. We, we knew the destination we wanted to get to. Yeah. We didn't know how to get there. Yeah. I mean, we had heard people um, like me get up and say, hey, here's how liberating it is to be debt free. Mm-hmm. And here's the opportunities we have because of that. Um, and that really looked appealing, but we didn't know yeah. the how. Right. Um, and what Financial Peace University does is gives you the how. Yeah, and because it, it probably is like, wait, nobody else does that. Like, what? I don't even have a category to think like that. Yeah, it's counterintuitive to the culture we live in. I mean, yeah. we live in one of the most affluent zip codes in the country. Yeah. Um, and so it's it's counterintuitive. Yeah. I remember the first house I bought. My, the advice someone gave me was, "Hey, buy more than you can afford because you'll grow into it." Exactly. And I've heard so that. I think probably a lot of us have gotten that advice before. Um, hasn't always hasn't always helped, yeah. you know. So, so you guys, you got some training, and of course, you're going through financial peace now. Yeah. Why would you do that? Because I don't think I don't think you always ever get there. I mean, it's it's a. I think it's more of a journey than a destination. Yeah. Um, I think we're always on that journey. And so we backslide. We, mm-hmm. we fall backwards. And it's great reminders. We get little nuggets. We might give somebody else a nugget. Um, mm-hmm. But if we don't go through it, um, we, we've found over time that we just slide backwards a little bit. What did that do for you and Christina uh, when you went through some training of as far as your marriage goes and how it helped you get on the same page? Yeah, I mean, it, it's going to sound cliche and maybe people won't believe it, but it really, it, it, galvanized our marriage Mm -hmm. um, is probably the right word. I mean, we are closer today, and I really believe um, it's because we embrace those principles and we were living those principles out in our marriage, Mm -hmm. and it just made our marriage healthier. It made our relationship healthier. It made it more intimate, um, more purpose-filled. It it was really good. Yeah. Yeah. And so as you're now kind of on the back end of some of that, obviously you're still in the middle of it, but that part of it you've kind of moved through. Talk a little bit about um, man, the freedom that, you, that you've had and some of the blessing that you've had come out of that. I know specifically in there with your kids, you've had some incredible blessing. Yeah, that's probably the biggest piece. So you try and invest in kids, everybody. How many people have kids out here? 
Yeah, everybody. There's a lot of you guys. <laughs> so you're either a kid or you got a kid. Um, and, uh, and you want your kids to get it, right? I mean, we feel this joy, this purpose all in our lives, and we want our kids to experience the same thing. So recently, um, our son moved, moved to Dallas, Texas, he and his wife and family, and they just recently moved back, and they were looking at houses and so forth, and they made a decision to buy a different house than... Um, then I kind of steered him toward, and when I asked him why, he said, Dad, Darren and I want to be debt-free in seven years, wow. mortgage-free in seven years, yeah. and we can do that with this house and our current income. Yeah. So that was really cool to see, and then... Uh, what a great legacy. Yeah, yeah. our daughter Carly, um, who uh, is up at University of Georgia, mm. did I mention that? Yeah, yes. <laughs> um, dogs. Did I mention that they <laughs> won yesterday? No. <laughs> yes. We won't get into all that. Um, so our daughter Carly, I was talking with her, um, recently, well, not recently, but last summer. So um, she wanted to do this international study in Europe. And Who Christina, doesn't, by the way? Yeah, exactly. Come on. Did they even have that when we were in college? <laughs> what? Yeah, so I said, uh, Christina and I are sitting there with her. I said, Carly, you know, I would love for you to be able to do that, but I don't think we have the margin in life to be able to do that. So I think it's a no. And she says, well, I'll pay for it. And I was like, well, how are you going to pay for it? She says, I've saved money. Christina's like, well, you do the equestrian thing, you do school, you don't have time for a job, where'd you make money? She says, well, you give me money each month, I've saved it all, Come and on. I got enough to, to go. And so okay. Christina looks at her and she says, we're obviously giving you way too much money. <laughs> <laughs> and great, great line from Carly, she says, oh, so my reward for being faithful with finances is... <laughs> yeah, you think I get too much. You're going to lower my income, so... Yeah. Um, that, that was a pretty cute conversation. Yeah. Um, but in that conversation, we're talking with her, and we find out, didn't even know this, that she's tithing in the church up at Athens Church mm -hmm. that she's at, and, um, and just incredible things that we didn't even know were going on, and she's saving money we didn't know she was saving. Yeah. And then our middle son, Michael, was talking about, um, I've, I've had lunch with him on Friday, and he's talking about these boxes that Christina got when when they were kids she went to container store these boxes with three different drawers so the top drawer was um tithing or giving second drawer was saving third drawer was spending and they had to do that in that order yeah. um, and he's talking about how he's living his life that way because of something as simple as you know a container store box so it's, it's cool just to see you investing in them and that paying dividends Tell a little bit about Carly and giving. Like, why does she do that? Yeah, I asked her yesterday because I knew yeah. we were doing this. And I said, Carly, tell me why you give. And she says, because you taught us to. Hmm. And I said, well, wait a minute. Get, give me some more meat. She said, there's no more meat. You taught us to. And that's why I do it. Yeah. And you're <laughs> like, not, here's yeah. another 20. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah. it's not that complicated, yeah. right? Yeah. And then, um, now, I think what... Part of the story for her is really cool because you sell the you sell the, the equestrian center, but then just talk a little bit about what, what she, where she is and what happened yesterday. Yeah, so she got a scholarship to be on the equestrian team at University of Georgia, and yeah. this year they won the SEC championship. Um, the University of Georgia did yeah. against the University of Alabama. Oh, um, come on. And uh, so yesterday they got their rings and they got to go oh, out fun. on the field um, at halftime or in between quarters and fun. get their rings. And it was just, it was cool to see that, um, you know, you make this decision and you make some sacrifices and it's not that all of life goes away. Yeah. Um, God still gives us plenty of opportunity to celebrate and have joy filled moments and yeah. all of that. So w yesterday was one of those. Yeah. What a proud dad. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I'm that. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Wearing red, I would have been. <laughs> now, as you've kind of trans you've transitioned careers too. It wasn't just it wasn't just that when God freed you up. So a little bit about what you're doing now, man. Yeah, I uh, lead a ministry called Mission Hope. So we go into villages in three countries: Indonesia, Nicaragua, Dominican Republic, mm. and these are the <clears throat> most remote, isolated places on the earth. Just places people don't go to because it's too far, it's too uncomfortable, expensive, dangerous, inconvenient. Whatever the reason, people like you and I don't normally go to these villages, yeah. and we apply a very holistic model to empower them to move from where we meet them, which is extreme material poverty, to a place of thriving, thriving physically, 
Mm -hmm. emotionally, relationally, and most importantly, spiritually. So everything that we do is Christ-centered, village-led, and kind of a holistic model. Instead of just going in and preaching the good news, you're, you're meeting the needs of the people that we serve. And the gospel is doing clean water, and the gospel is providing education, and the gospel is proclaiming the promise of what a relationship with Jesus will do for yeah. you. So that's, that's kind of our approach of coming in mutual brokenness, so it's not the Westerners coming you're broken and we're here to fix you. It's coming and saying, yeah. we're all broken. Um, and God's desire is to restore all of us, Stephen, Michael, somebody in a remote village in Nicaragua to how he created the world to be. Yeah. And so yeah, Mission Hope is one of the is an, uh, uh, organization we're looking to do more with. As a matter of fact, we're going to Indonesia in February. January, January. Yeah, yeah, yeah January. a little bit later to see kind of what God's up to there. And I, I think that for, for a lot of people, um, Mike, not, not everybody, like they're, they don't create margin just to go into ministry or to start a nonprofit, um, but there's more to it than that, wouldn't you say? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, it, it's it's challenging because people sitting here look mm -hmm. up here and they say, "Well, Stephen's a pastor, or Mike's in full-time ministry, and I'm never going to be called to that." Um, but I think he has a yes for all of us. It might be a really big yes. It might be a really small yes or somewhere in between. But God's got a yes. And when we don't allow the margin in our lives to be able to respond properly to that yes, he's going to go find someone else that's ready for the yes. Mm -hmm. um, and I just believe that being faithful with what God has blessed us with creates the margin in our lives to be able to uh, respond appropriately and say yes. Yeah, that's yeah. good. What do you like if if you were just kind of looking back on the last few years and all that you've done? What would you say it's done for your family now? Like mm. as you just kind of sit here and look back. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think we're more joy filled. We're more purposeful. Um, we're more um, intimate as a family. And what I mean in that is uh, we we pray as a family. We we have moments as a family that um, we didn't used to have. Yeah. And I don't know what the magic is in that other than Jesus being in the middle of it. Yeah. Um, and a part of that was being faithful with what he's blessed us with. Um, sure. And he shaped us as a family. My kids have been in the mission field with me. My wife has been yeah. there. Um, and it's not that we've given up everything and that we're living like paupers because if you come to our house, we have a, we have a nice house. We're well blessed. Yeah. Um, but we're living in enough margin to be able to respond to the yes, whatever it is. If somebody comes and says, hey, I'm going on a mission trip. I need some support. We can write them a check. Yeah. Um, we don't have to say, hmm, we, we've got a fund just for that kind of thing. Yeah. And, and that gives us great joy. It's amazing. Yeah. That's what giving does. Yeah. If you, so there's some people who, I um, mean, they're hesitant for whatever reason to sign up for Financial Peace University. There's a lot of reasons. It could be embarrassment. It could be stubbornness. It could be mm. scheduling busy life. What would you say to someone who feels hesitant um, mm. to sign up and hasn't done that yet? I, I think I would say realign the can't. So it's easy to say, hey, it's nine weeks, I can't do nine weeks. It's a hundred bucks, I can't do a hundred bucks. Um, it's not the church's responsibility to tell me about how I should spend my money, I can't do that. And if you realign the can't um, and say, you know what, I can't come home and have the conversations I'm having with my wife about money anymore. Yeah. I can't get to the end of the month and realize that the money ran out before the month ended. I can't go on with life um, with no, no plan yeah. for what I'm going to do with the money that God's given me. Yeah. Um, and what Financial Peace University does is give you biblical principles that help you create the plan right. um, and have power over your money, I think is how Dave Ramsey says yeah. it. It's just, yeah. you know, instead of your money um, controlling you, we control our money, which is, I think, God's design for it. Yeah. So in closing, if you had just some parting words, what would, just after all that you've experienced, the faith steps that you've taken, man, the way you've seen God come through, like what would you say? I'd just say create margin to live the yes because um, the yes feels a whole lot better than, um, Reinsel, I gave you A, B, C, and D, and you whiffed, man. You mailed it in. Um, I yeah. mean, one day I believe we've got to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Jesus and account for all that he's blessed us with. Yeah. Um, and I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, instead of Reinsel, you didn't get it done. Right, right. So that's, that's the word is just 
Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Well, man, thank you so much for your story and for sharing with us and opening up to us. Let's give Mike a round of applause. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, man. Thank you very much. So as we close out today, I know that, you know, the yes for you may, is not going to look like Mike's, but be like Mike <laughs> in the sense that you just create margin in your life to be able to do whatever God wants you to do. I mean, for some of you, man, you, you're, you feel strapped and angered and choking and you're embarrassed and you've made bad decisions. You don't know where to turn and you're like, I just don't want to, I don't even want to look into that. Man, today's a day of freedom for you. Man, don't wait. Don't get down two years, five years from now and wish that you'd have done something different. Man, today's the day for you to get signed up. Man, you're going to be in a class with, uh, you know, over 500 people from our church. And I'm certain after today will be over 600. Man, where you can have an opportunity to learn what God says, to invite God into your finances so that you can have a plan. Some of you are far down the road and you've already got some margin. But as you begin to look at it, like, I wonder if I have the margin that I need. What if God's calling you to something even more different than what you've already bought into? You know, I believe that there are people here that God does want you to sell your house, that God does want you to step into some significant freedom, that God does want you to do something different, not what culture has said, but man, God has got a life plan for you that's beyond anything you could ever ask or imagine. I mean, and I believe these are the steps of courage that God wants us to take as families, as individuals, and as a church. So I just encourage you today, man, don't miss this opportunity. Don't get down the road and miss out. It'll be a great way for you to learn. It's going to be a great way for you to get connected into the life of our church because we truly are believing it's a new day. We believe it's a new day for you, for your family, for our church, and we believe this is the next step. So just want to encourage you as we exit today, man, grab those cards that are in your seats, take them out to a table, one of the what-if tables that's out in the lobby, man, and just get plugged into a class and just trust God for nine weeks and just see what he will do. Let's pray together. God, you own it all, of course. And so we just look to you now to, man, thank you for the way you blessed us, man, to live in a a community where we have just so many nice things. It's a blessing. We're grateful for that. But God, help us to never be settled that that's the end of our lives, that that's the goal, that's the terminating point. But that, God, you've called us to something bigger, something greater, something that has purpose and something that can last, to lay up treasures in heaven. And, God, help us to never get so short-sighted. Help us to never get so caught up in the moment that we forget that. And so, God, I just pray for freedom now for families. God, I believe that there are some families now that are going to look back on this time, on these nine weeks, and they're going to recognize it charted a different course. It moved them to a different future, and they'll be able to help lay the groundwork maybe for their marriage, God, as they're content- thinking about getting married today. Or maybe there's some parents here, and they need to sow some really good seeds in the lives of their kids so that as their kids grow up, they understand what it means to be faithful to God and to understand God's blessing in their life. And Lord, I believe that's this time period. And so, God, we just ask for your favor. Lord, thanks uh, for so many families and so many people that have signed up and that have just made this commitment to you to understand more about what you say about finances, about our stuff, about our treasure, and ultimately about our heart. God, I pray you rescue some marriages these nine weeks. God, those who may be under some stress, tension, anxiety over a lot of different facets, but once they get on the same page, with this, God, you're going to save them and rescue them, God, that you're going to help people know what career to go in, God, that we would have people that would even change careers based on what you're doing in our, their lives. And God, for people who maybe need to be called out to start other movements, other churches that look just like this one, that God, these are the days where you laid the foundation for that. And God, we're grateful. Thank you for all that you're doing, for the transformation that we've seen. But God, we ask for more, and we just pray in Jesus' name. Amen.